Hello, this is Alan Septoff uh, with Earthworks and welcome to the webinar, uh, Making Fracking Air Pollution Invisible, Fracking Air Pollution Visible uh, and how we get EPA to do its job and help protect us. Uh, I'm Alan Septoff, Communications Director for Earthworks and we're hosting this webinar along with Clean Air Task Force and Sierra Club. Earthworks is a national environmental nonprofit we've been work uh, who works to protect communities and the environment from the destructive impacts of resource extraction. We've been working on onshore oil and gas development for more than 25 years since well before the fracking boom started. And in that time we've seen a lot of changes. Um, in the beginning, uh, we worked under the supposition that oil and gas development could be done right. Um, but with the onset of the fracking boom, and especially with research uh, we've done that shows how states do and don't, and actually don't, um, protect the public, um, we've come to believe that uh, communities are more or less living with oil and gas development and pollution with no recourse uh, or little recourse um, when things go wrong. And uh, that is why um, we've got uh, this FLIR infrared camera um, that we are going to be uh, showing uh, videos, showing you what the power of these are and how we might bring them to your communities. Um, with the power of video um, and making what is invisible, usually invisible, visible, uh, you create, we can create pressure that requires uh, regulators and industry and media to pay attention. So as a complement to that, um, we will also be talking about uh, a new proposed rule from the Environmental Protection Agency that will limit methane and other air pollution that uh, is emitted along with methane from um, oil and gas development. Um, EPA's proposed rule, the comment period for which closes in mid-November, um, EPA's proposed rule would limit the pollution that we're going to be showing you um, uh, from new and modified sources. And uh, Clean Air Task Force and Sierra Club are going to be talking a bit about the mechanics of this rule and how we need to strengthen it so that we can help people uh, who are in most immediate need of help. Um, so the people, uh, let me tell you a bit about how we're going to uh, do this webinar. Um, Along with me there, we will have our Texas organizer, Sharon Wilson, um, who is a uh, certified uh, operator of the FLIR GF350 uh, infrared camera, which is the same camera that regulators and industry use uh, to detect leaks from oil and gas development. Um, she's going to show you videos. Um, after that, we are going to hear from uh, the Clean Air Task Force uh, who are going to give an overview of the uh, EPA rule. Um, then we're going to hear uh, from Joanne Spaulding um, from the Sierra Club who's going to talk about why the rule is so important and um, why it's important to add existing sources um, uh, to strengthen the rule. Um, after that, we will hear from Lauren Pagel, uh, Earthworks Policy Director, 
who will uh, talk about how you can get involved in uh, making EPA do its job better um, to strengthen this rule. Um, and after that, we will have a question and answer period where folks on the call can um, ask what this means to them, how we can how we can bring uh, the infrared camera to your community and anything else uh, that folks want to discuss. Um, the way we're going to have questions is you can enter a question, ask a question at any time in the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. And then at the end, um, we will put those questions to our panel uh, and we will discuss them. So please, as questions occur to you, don't wait. Just type them in and uh, we will uh, get to them at the end. So uh, without further ado, uh, I am going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Sharon Wilson, our Texas organizer. Again, she is a uh, certified operator, certified using the same certification course that regulators and industry use um, to operate a FLIR, which means forward-looking infrared GF320 camera which is also the same model camera that industry and regulators use to detect leaks and other air pollution from um, oil and gas development. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to you, Sharon. Hello, everybody. Um, could I have my slide, Alan? Um, the GF in the FLIR GF350 camera stands for gas find. So it is a forward-looking infrared gas find camera. And it um, detects infrared, which is invisible heat or thermal radiation. Um, and it, uh, hydrocarbons are also invisible, but they absorb a specific wavelength of inf infrared. So this GF camera, this GF320 camera is tuned to the specific wavelength where most hydrocarbon gases, infrared absorption occurs. And it's called optical gas imaging and it allows us to see these invisible gases. And I am a certified optical gas imaging thermographer. And how do I get to the next slide? These are the um, gases that the FLIR gas find camera is third party uh, certified to detect and these are the leak rates, the uh, minimum detection leak rates at which they're certified, it's certified to detect. So it can detect a very, very small leak. Um, and uh, you can see some of, I highlighted some of the most uh, important ones or the ones of most concern, benzene, ethyl benzene, methane, toluene, and xylene. Now I'd like to show you some, um, just a few FLIR videos. And hopefully this is working and my screen is up. Not yet, Sharon, hold on a second. Okay, it's not working anyway. So your screen should be coming up. Okay. But my computer is not cooperating. So I may not be able to show all of the videos that I had planned. Let me see if this one will work. Um, are you seeing this, Alan? Yes. Okay. This is um, a wastewater pit in California and the, these are emissions coming from this wastewater pit. These pits are being used to, uh, the water in these pits are being used to water the uh, produce in California. And so that's just an awful lot of air pollution coming from these pits. 
And the next video I'd like to show you is from North Dakota. This will have a little bit of sound with it in the beginning. It's not going to work either. Okay, let me try this one. I'm going to try it without enlarging my screen. Um, when I took this video, this is from Colorado. I am standing on the parking lot of North Ridge High School looking across the parking lot and across the athletic field. These, uh, the emissions are the huge release coming from this uh, oil and gas facility are going out into the neighborhood. Uh, very nice neighborhood all around there. This is what they call liquids offloading. And if you look very closely down at the source of the big black cloud, you can see a, a little man walking around there. He is um, opening the hatch to remove the liquids from the tank. This activity is an allowed activity. This is not a, a leak. It's just something that is allowed. It may happen many, many times a day at these facilities and it's something that has to happen when they offload these liquids. And this is a different source of air pollution. This shows a leak. This is a leak coming from two valve boxes. And this is a pretty substantial leak in New Mexico on some public lands in New Mexico. So now let me try to go back and see if I'm able to show, no, it's not going to let me show these other videos, so. Sharon, try and refresh. Just hit the yeah. refresh. You know, I tried that earlier and it and it didn't work. Yep. Let me so, try, try it again. Okay, there we go. This is a video from Texas. Texas is a really um, big offender. These, the, the, the sources of these emissions are coming from the tanks and from the flare. And they could be coming from open thief hatches on the tanks or leaky thief hatches. They could be venting intentionally. But it's just, this is an ongoing. I filmed this site over many days, went back several weeks, filmed it again. I've been to this site several times. And this is not um, an upset or anything like that. This is the way that they operate. And this is what I see at many, many facilities in the Eagle Ford Shale. So we have been with this camera to New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Texas, and um, California. And I'm seeing these kind of emissions happen everywhere I go. Uh, this is from a storage tank in California. I wanted to show you a video um, of a um, facility that was right by a school, but that's not working out. So there's a few examples of the emissions that what we're seeing with this, this camera all over the country. Should I show more? Um, I, it would be great if you could show the pipeline one, I think. Oh, um, did I not show that one? Okay, let me see. Uh, and start, yeah, start in. Let me start it right here where we'll get a little bit. You can, you can tell the amount of pressure that this is coming out by the sound it makes. And this is in North Dakota. This is a pipeline uh, vent where they're having a pipeline blowdown. This event is not covered by the methane rules. The, the waste pit that I showed you, um, this event that's happening right now, that you're seeing right now, and the um, 
event in Colorado where they were offloading the liquids, none of those are covered by the EPA methane rule. And what we're seeing in every state we've been to is just an awful lot of emissions coming out of these facilities. Sometimes it is just unimaginable what's happening and it's consistent and it's ongoing and it's everywhere that we've been with the camera we see these kinds of things happening. And it's important to realize that as you are looking at this, this is an infrared camera and the, what you're seeing here is normally not visible. And so uh, in places where we have gone, especially in Colorado and uh, New Mexico and, and Texas, um, just taking this video and then being able to share it with neighbors, with decision makers, um, with media has drawn reactions um, where before it was extremely hard to uh, get attention. Uh, once something, once people can see something, it becomes more real. And I can stop any time, but this is kind of interesting because this is actually a natural gas power plant. A clean burning natural gas. So I think we are ready to transition, uh, Sharon, to Leslie and Sarah from uh, Clean Air Task Force, if that's okay with you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. So, um, uh, Sarah, Sarah Yule, and Leslie Fleischman from Clean Air Task Force will speak. Um, after that, we will hear a representative from the Sierra Club, I believe, um, and then we will hear from Lauren Pagel uh, at Earthworks to talk about uh, how you can get. Um, uh, involved and bring pressure to bear on the Environmental Protection Agency. All along, you can ask questions in the question box, and we will get to those at the Q&A uh, section at the end uh, of the presentation. So, uh, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Alan. And there are our, our slides. Perfect. So, what will these standards that EPA has proposed for new and modified sources achieve? Well, first, we wanted to underscore on the next slide the scope of this problem that the agency is working to tackle. As I'm sure you can imagine from Sharon's videos, when you multiply these leaks and vents and flaring activities out, the impacts are huge, both, both for the climate and for our health. On the climate front, Methane pollution is the second most important driver of climate change after carbon dioxide, and the oil and gas industry is the largest industrial source. EPA very conservatively estimates the amount of pollution, and on a 20-year time frame, it's equivalent to the climate impact of 166 coal-fired power plants or 133 million cars. That's more than half the number of cars and trucks in the U.S. This is using the latest global warming potential figures from the IPCC. So huge impact on climate. And because methane is short-lived in the atmosphere, cutting the pollution will is really the biggest thing we can do to affect climate change in our lifetimes, to curb the climate change that we are all experiencing. But it's not just climate change that we're worried about. On the next slide, 
methane leaks and is emitted along with smog forming and toxic chemicals that escape from these oil and gas sites, harming air quality and endangering the health of people working near these sites, like that man Sharon pointed out, near the tank and in neighboring communities, right? Oftentimes this development is happening very close to where people live, work, and go to school. Some of the chemicals coming out along with methane include benzene, which is a known human carcinogen. A 2012 study estimated a 10 in a million cancer risk for residents living near a well pad and that was primarily attributable to benzene. There's also a growing body of scientific research indicating that oil and gas development is associated with a number of adverse health impacts in humans, including premature birth, certain birth defects, and low birth weight for infants of mothers, infants born to mothers living near this development. Air pollution from the industry is hypothesized to be contributing to the observed associations. And we have a number of maps like this one showing where the pollution is happening and showing how it overlaps with city centers or, in this case, percentage of population living in poverty. On the next slide, so what exactly are these standards? First of all, um, at a high level, this industry, the oil and gas industry, has avoided many, many comprehensive environmental regulations for decades. So it's historic for a couple of reasons. First, that these rules represent compre a comprehensive set of air standards for the industry, really the first set. And also, it's the first time that methane is being regulated nationally from this industry a huge, huge source. And overall, the proposal is pretty strong, albeit, of course, it only looks at new and modified equipment. We're particularly glad to see the broadly applicable leak detection and repair requirements. So companies are going to have to go out with those cameras that Sharon fortunately has and find and fix leaks. The standards also cover quite a broad range of sources, although there could be improvements there. And one of those sources that's important to mention is limits on venting of gas during oil well completions. I'll turn it over to Leslie to talk about some of these specific sources more in more detail and some ways they could be better addressed. Leslie, are you there? Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks, Sarah. So I'm going to run through the nuts and bolts of the oil and gas methane rule for new and modified sources that the EPA proposed in August. So next slide, please. So the EPA proposed leak detection and repair, or LDAR, standards that would apply to all new and modified well sites and compressor stations. LDAR standards at gas processing plants were already included in the 2012 oil and gas VOC rule. Leaks can be detected with the infrared camera technology that Aaron, Alan and Sharon discussed earlier. And the proposal calls for semi-annual leak surveys at all new and modified facilities and repair of all leaks that are discovered. This can reduce the amount of methane leaking at these facilities by 60%. So widespread and regular leak detection surveys are a critical part of any methane reduction plan because they can detect super emitters. Th these are the small number of leaking components that account for a disproportionate share of leaking methane. So we are pleased to see that the EPA has proposed a methane-based leak detection and repair program. However, the approach EPA took in its leak detection standards has a few shortcomings, which I wanted to mention here. First, we think that the proposed rule lets operators go too long in between inspections. Like I said, it calls for semi-annual surveys. We have found that quarterly or even monthly surveys can be cost effective and they will protect the public health of local communities and the climate even more. 
And these monthly or quarterly inspections can reduce methane emissions by upwards of 80%. In addition, the proposal has provisions that allow oil and gas companies to move from semi-annual to annual surveys when they find relatively few leaks at a site. Now, recent science shows that a facility's percentage of leaking components does not accurately predict its emissions. So allowing oil and gas companies to reduce survey frequency based on the results of prior inspections will not effectively reduce harmful leaks. So we are calling for the EPA to improve upon its proposal by requiring frequent and fixed leak detection surveys. But overall, the proposal is a very important step in the right direction. Uh, next slide, please. So the proposal requires companies to reduce emissions from hydraulically fractured oil well completions. This is an extension of previous requirements for completions at hydraulically fractured gas wells in the 2012 rule. Companies must capture the gas that currently escapes into the air during completion events using either green completions or burning the escaping gas in a flare. But both methods would reduce met methane emissions from oil well completions by up to 95%. However, Green completions are preferable to flaring since they reduce harmful pollution and avoid waste. And in almost all cases, companies can utilize the gas instead of flaring it if they plan properly and design their equipment accordingly. The EPA should spe specify that the use of flares should be permitted only in exceptional circumstances where it is genuinely infeasible to use green completion equipment. Uh, next slide. Um, compressors are used at oil well uh, throughout the oil and gas industry, and the EPA has proposed standards for, for new and modified reciprocating and centrifugal compress compressors at transmission and storage stations. Compressors at gathering and boosting stations and at gas processing plants were already covered by the 2012 rules. So first, for new and modified centrifugal compressors, the proposal includes three compliance options. First, the first two apply to centrifugal compressors with wet seals and involve capturing vented gas before it escapes into the atmosphere. Either routing this methane vented from wet seals back to a, the compressor intake or routing the methane to a flare. Both options would reduce methane by 95%, but flaring is not preferable. As I discussed earlier, flaring should only be allowed in emergency situations. And the third option here is installing a dry seal compressor system, which would result in inherently lower methane emissions. So next on reciprocating compressors, there are also three compliance options. The first two involve replacement of rod packing, the part of the compressor that controls escaping gas. The rod packing can wear out and become less effective over time, so the proposal calls for replacement either every three years or every 26,000 hours of operation. Rod packing replacement can reduce methane emissions from this source by up to 80%. Alternatively, companies can route escaping gas through a closed vent system so that it can be reused, and this would reduce emissions by up to 95%. And next slide. And finally, I wanted to talk about pneumatic pumps and pneumatic controllers, two types of equipment that are also used throughout the oil and gas industry. The proposal covers new and modified pneumatic pumps located at oil and gas production sites, at gas processing plants, and at transmission and storage compressor stations. At production sites and transmission stage stations, the proposal would require companies to capture 95% of the methane that is vented from these pumps. But this requirement would only go into effect at facilities that already have an emissions control device on site. So uh, pneumatic pumps at sites without, without these control devices could continue venting, which is a concern of ours. Um, for pumps at processing plants, the proposal sets a zero emissions limit so a 100% reduction. 
and they will be able to do this using instrument air pumps or electric pumps um, due to the availability of uh, electricity on these sites. Um, and finally, pneumatic controllers. Um, the proposal covers pneumatic controllers at transmission and storage compressor stations. And they previously covered pneumatic controllers at gathering and boosting stations and at gas processing plants in their earlier 2012 rules. Companies must replace high bleed pneumatic controllers with low bleed ones, which are supposed to emit less than six cubic feet of methane per hour. There are a few shortcomings with the, with the pneumatic controller standards um, that I wanted to mention. First, the EPA did not extend its requirements to intermittent bleed or snap acting pneumatic controllers. The EPA considers these to be inherently low emitting sources because they only vent when actuating. However, uh, data from the EPA's own greenhouse gas reporting program shows that intermittent bleed devices are a significant source of methane and they should also be controlled. In addition, recent research has suggested that the so-called low bleed pneumatic controllers vent more methane than previously thought. So we will be asking the EPA to include requirements for the use of zero bleed options where feasible rather than low bleed pneumatic controllers. So with that, I'll turn the presentation back to Sarah, but I'll be happy to answer any questions during the Q&A. Thanks, Leslie. Complicated standards. So EPA estimates, they've produced some estimates overall of how much pollution would be reduced from all of these requirements, which are listed on the next slide. And they've done the same for both methane and VOCs for some standards that are proposed called control technique guidelines that would help to curb emissions from existing sources in certain places, certain ozone non-attainment areas and also the ozone transport region in the Northeast. Taken together, uh, the methane rule in particular would basically level off the projected increase in emissions. Emissions are expected to grow from this industry about 25% by 2025, and these rules for new and modified sources would help flatten that increase out. Overall, the methane standards would have the climate benefit of roughly taking 6.5 million cars off the road. And on the next slide, finally, wanted to talk about the air quality implications. This industry, in, the bars in red, is a huge source of VOC pollution, these smog forming chemicals and toxics. And EPA took a stab at cutting the emissions in 2012 with the green completion requirements. The proposal is over there, second bar from the left. It would also have some significant benefits. And then the dashed line represents our estimate of how much pollution, VOC pollution that is, would be reduced if the administration met its aspirational goal of curbing methane from the industry 40 to 45 percent. So you can see that the steps that have been taken are important and um, comparable to many other regulations that have been finalized, but there is a huge amount more to do. And that is that is it for us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, again, we will take, you can enter questions in your questions box uh, as the presentation is going on. We will get to them at the end. And now I'm going to turn it over to Joanne Spaulding. Um, who is Chief Climate Counsel for the Sierra Club. Uh, Joanne. Thanks, Alan, and um, thanks to everybody for joining the webinar today. Um, I'm just going to talk actually pretty briefly, although I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later if, there, if people want to know more details, about a little bit of the legal structure for how um, what the rules that EPA has adopted and proposed so far and what um, what we have what our goal is in terms of getting EPA to really um, fully address methane emissions. So um, you've heard a lot about the details of the rule. I won't go into that too much, um, but just to, as a reminder, EPA uh, finalized regulations for um, uh, VOCs back in 2012, and 
part of that, part of its goal in those, in when it adopted those regulations was that, well, at least part of the impact of those regulations was that um, they did reduce methane emissions for some uh, parts of the sector um, because VOCs and methane uh, occur together in many places in the um, across the sector. So, um, for instance, with the green completions, capturing the VOCs um, at the wellhead has also, you know, it, it's beneficial for methane emission reductions. It basically captures all those methane emissions with it. So, um, the, that was not direct regulation of methane, and at the time, uh, we and other organizations advocated to EPA that they they use their authority to address existing regulation, uh, existing methane emissions. I'm, I'm sorry, existing sources of methane emissions. Uh, but they didn't do that at that point, um, and they still haven't. So let me say, tell you what they have done. So in that case, they regulated uh, VOCs. These these new um, the, the new proposal does regulate methane directly. Uh, but it does not do so from existing sources. It's only new and modified sources. Um, EPA is, the, under the statute, and this is Section 111 of the Clean Air Act, EPA uh, has the authority to regulate new and modified sources under 111B, that's B as in boy, and that um, basically modifications are treated as new sources. So to the extent that EPA can define a change at a, at a source as a modification, it can then bring that into the new source rule, which is what it did in 2012 with green completions. And so there are other ways to do that in this sector as well. But there is a vast array of sources that are already out there spewing methane emissions that are not regulated under this um, structure at all. Now EPA, once it regulates new sources in a category for uh, greenhouse gases and, and um, methane and other greenhouse gases, it is required to uh, adopt guidelines for standards for existing sources. And that, um, what the process for doing that is that EPA issues a binding guidance to the states and then the states implement it. They by they write a plan to implement it. And EPA has done this on a few occasions for other pollutants. And it's actually the same statute, same same provision of the Clean Air Act that EPA is using in the Clean Power Plan. Um, how, so it's it's um, it's a very robust p provision. But so far, EPA has not proposed those standards. Um, the, the importance of the new source, new, this, the proposals that are on the table right now are that um, in order to cover existing sources under 111D, as in DOG, that's the, that's the provision of the Clean Air Act that covers the existing sources, EPA, there, there has to be a, a new source standard for that that component for that for that emission emitting unit, and the importance of these sources that of these rules that EPA is now proposing is that um, what, what we need EPA to do is to cover the full range of new and modified sources, so that when it does eventually get to regulating existing sources, which it will be legally required to do once these rules are final, it can then um, cover that same range of sources. If it leaves anything out of the new source final rule, it won't be able to get to that that um, emitting source in the existing source rules. So for example, um, there was a mention of pneumatic controllers, intermittent bleed pneumatic controllers that, that's not covered. It's possible, and we would might have arguments for why EPA could cover the, an existing source, but it's possible that if there's no new source standard, there couldn't be an existing source standard. And in terms of stringency, the more stringent the new source standard is, the, the more stringent EPA will have be able to make the existing source standard. Um, that's not actually a legal requirement, but it's just sort of a practical requirement. Um, now, there are other ways that EPA could get at methane emissions, as they did in the 2012 proposal or, or final rule, and they um, and you know, and those include the uh, 
control technique guidelines that were mentioned. It also includes regulation of hazardous air pollutants. But in order to really get at uh, methane emissions reductions, there's nothing like actually regulating the pollutant that you're trying to um, where you're when you're trying to reduce that particular pollutant. So the the best way for EPA to go about that is through adopting existing source rules under Section 111D. And you know the, the these the proposals that are out there are very important for setting that up. And we are um, advocating that EPA move forward with that as expeditiously as possible. It can't do it before new sources, but it can do it. Um, you know, as soon as these new source uh, rules are final, um, existing EPA can finalize existing source rules expeditiously after that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions in the question and answers period. Thank you, Joanne. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Earthworks Policy Director Lauren Pagel, and she will talk a bit about um, how folks can uh, get involved in the effort to strengthen uh, the EPA uh, methane and VOC rule. Um, and maybe, Lauren, you can also talk a bit about how people can uh, bring um, our FLIR camera to their community. Yes. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining. So as, as Joanne just said, um, you know, we are pushing so hard for strong new and modified source rule from EPA because that sets us up for the strongest existing source rule um, from EPA to really help the folks that are currently living um, with air pollution from oil and gas in their backyard right now. Um, we actually have uh, a lot of different groups, um, including the ones on this call and across the country who are working in a coordinated effort to get the strongest rules possible um, out of EPA. Um, our, um, our goal is to capture those existing sources um, and really um, force this industry to um, abide by the same rules as so many other organizations, uh, uh, other industries do. Um, you know, the Clean Air Act is intended to protect us, um, and uh, and this industry really hasn't had um, to deal uh, as much with pollution and emissions reductions um, under the Clean Air Act, and now it's going to have to um, because of this process that's just beginning with this new modified source rule. Um, so, um, for folks who are interested in getting in involved um, in this larger effort. Um, there is, uh, there are many listservs, and I'm sure you all love joining a new listserv, <laughs> um, but um, Sarah Yule um, with Clean Air Task Force, her um, email address is, is up on your screen. Um, you can join the Methane Partners list where you will get updates and information about um, uh, about what's going on with the EPA rule, campaign activities, and what we're doing to push the EPA for stronger standards. Um, we are actually circulating a sign-on letter um, to push uh, the EPA to include some of these additional sources um, and make sure uh, things like leak detection and repair happen more often. Um, and I have been circulating that letter around a lot of listservs. Um, please email me if you have not seen it, um, and I will um, send it out to you, and we're looking for as many organizations as possible to sign on to that. Um, and if you're interested in having Earthworks um, Infrared uh, Gas Finder camera come to your uh, neighborhood, um, we, uh, we are open for 2016 at this point. Um, right now we've got 2015 pretty much booked. Um, but if you're interested, um, please uh, email me or Sharon or Alan, um, whose email addresses are up on your screen, um, or go to CEP, which is Citizens Empowerment Project, um, .earthworks.org, where you can see all of our videos um, and, uh, and set up uh, the camera to, to come to your town. And I'll turn it back over to Alan for questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Lauren and Joanne and Leslie and Sarah and Sharon. Um, so we have quite a few questions uh, that have been sent 
over the uh, the course of the webinar. Um, so many that we might not be able to get to them all, so apologies if we don't get to yours. Um, the first question uh, is uh, what, and I guess this is for somebody from Clean Air Task Force, what is the methane impact number you are using? Sure. I think I think the question is about the global warming potential of methane. And I believe in all of our calculations we used 87, which is the fossil methane global warming potential in the latest IPCC assessment. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, for Sharon, um, what is low or non-gas FLIR uh, baseline, I guess a FLIR, ba FLIR camera baseline? I don't understand that question. What is it? What is the, maybe it makes more sense if I ask it this way, what is the baseline um, for the FLIR camera so that we can, uh, the transition from VOCs to non-VOCs? Does that make sense? No, it do, I don't understand the question, the baseline for the camera. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. Okay. Uh, if um, they can explain, if they so, can ask the question another way, um, but yeah, that the, the follow-up question might clarify it. An older industry criticism of FLIR uh, was that FLIR also detected water vapor, steam. How does a FLIR not detect um, things that aren't pollutants? How do we know what we're looking at is our pollutants? Um, part of that is in the training. Now, the steam will dissipate very quickly, and uh, it's not going to be shown as a plume that uh, travels off away from the site. As all the videos I showed, you can clearly see that this uh, air pollution is going and traveling a long way. Steam is going to dissipate. Very quickly it dissipates. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, for um, Clean Air Task Force folks or Joanne, uh, how will the EPA uh, methane rules be enforced? Joanne, could you take that one? Sure. So um, the the um, new, new source performance standards are uniform national standards, and they apply directly to facilities. So they are um, they are federally enforceable. Uh, many states have um, implementation plans that um, that apply to um, source categories, and they would they might also be incorporated into state permits, but, um, but they are directly enforceable against the, um, the uh, regulated sources in federal court. Do citizens have a role uh, uh, in enforcing these? There are, you, citizens can enforce them, uh, and you know, it's there's there are always uh, evidentiary issues and that sort of thing, and where do you get your information, um, and you know how do you know that there's a violation, um, uh, but but yes, they are enforceable by citizens. Thank you. Uh, another question for Sharon: At what stage of the process does uh, the infrared camera find the most emissions? Are you there, um, Sharon? At what at what stage of the process? I I would say from on the the well sites at the pad sites is where we have mostly been and detected the emissions. But there are emissions, as you see, coming from the wastewater pits and from the pipelines, um, processing facilities um, generally have quite a bit of emissions and. Uh, Compressor stations have a lot, so if I had to pick my favorite place, I, I don't know. I guess 
it depends on what state you're in too because the processes are a little bit different in every state. In Texas, in the Eagle Ford, for example, it's clearly the emissions from these um, central processing facilities from the tanks and the flares are just horrible. Um, so it, d it just depends kind of on where you are. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, question for Lauren. Um, have any states separately adopted standards or rules similar to what EPA is proposing? Uh, yes. So the state of Colorado um, has actually led the way um, with um, its own uh, methane standards for the state, um, um, which are, are good, but they, they actually cover existing sources. Um, so if you live in Colorado, um, uh, you should be more protected from air pollution, from oil and gas drilling than other states. Um, and we are also hopeful that we may see similar uh, rules in Pennsylvania as well. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I think this is a question for uh, Clean Air Task Force folks. Um, will pollution from uh, wastewater injection wells be covered by the EPA rule? So, no, I don't believe that those are covered by the current proposal. So that's something for us to ask for. And um, Alan, just to follow up on the global warming potential, I wanted to clarify that as we stated in the slides, it's a 20-year look. So it depends on the time frame. Gotcha. Um, a question for Joanne. Um, will the leak detection surveys be publicly available? And if so, how can we access them? I am sorry, but I don't know the answer to that. I believe they need to be reported, but I um, we will have to check in on that and get back to the, the person asking the question. I, I don't know in what form they'll be available. I think the information will be, but, but we need to check that out. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question uh, could be for Clean Air Task Force, actually just for the panel in general. Um, if there are already designs for green completions, um, and perhaps uh, in the process of answering this, somebody could define what a green completion is, um, why is the industry not using it now? Well, some, some companies are more forward-thinking than others and we find that not just with the green completions but with a lot of these technologies that might pay for themselves in less than a year because the companies can actually sell the gas that they capture in many cases or use it on site for power generation but it seems like a lot of the companies are are looking at what's going to give them the highest return for their investment and in some cases that might just be doing a dirty job and moving on to drill the next well and so it's just this classic case of an externality and a reason why we need government regulations. Leslie, could you give the quick definition of a reduced emission completion? Sure, right, and green completion and reduced emission completion, those are synonyms for the same thing, which just means um, as they're doing the completion process at a hydraulically fractured well, there's a lot of gas um, and other stuff that comes out of the well. Um, that would otherwise be, be vented or, or flared, but the reduced emission completion equipment captures it and processes it and, and puts it into the pipeline before it's able to escape into the atmosphere. Thank you, Sharon and Leslie. Uh, I mean, Sarah and Leslie. Sharon, what makes one gas appear darker than another? Um, well, it could be that uh, there's more gases absorbing more um, infrared, and it could be that there's less background distortion. Many different variables in that, 
could be happening. And as far as why the camera um, shows the emissions and it sometimes as black or sometimes as white, um, we were told in our class that the camera itself will pick the polarity that best shows the the gases and I found that that is pretty consistent. So uh, a follow-up on that uh, from me actually. So the, the clearest, um, darkest pollution was from the pipe venting which also is uh, almost certainly the video that showed the, the most pollution. Um, is there, if, if, the, if it's darker, does that mean that there's more pollution or, um, or not? I don't think that you can necessarily say that, but it, it, it was just with the Northridge High School, as you saw, those emissions were very black. But when I showed the video of the pit, I changed the polarity on the camera, and it was pretty much equal when it was um, the white on black as it was the black on white. So um, I, I'm not. There are ways to measure the um, emissions, but they're very, very complicated and um, not something that it would have to happen in a laboratory. Thank you, Sharon. Um, for the panel, um, are the proposed leak surveys we were talking about earlier um, with Joanne, are those surveys to be performed by industry employees? And if so, do states also verify the reports initially and ensure that repairs are addressed promptly or how, how do they work? So I can, speak to, yep. I can speak to the repairs, um, and the regulation requires companies to repair leaks that they find within 15 days of finding them, and then there's a follow-up um, a little while later to ensure that it has stopped leaking. Um, however, there are some exceptions that allow them to go longer um, before repair if there are you know, safety concerns. Um, and that, that exception is something that we are also going to be commenting on. But for the most part, it's a 15-day repair time frame. When there is uh, pollution detected, is the public notified? I don't think there's any, there's any provision that would require public notification. Uh, it, at the at that time, I mean, they, there's a, um, you know, there are there are reporting requirements eventually, but nothing that you know in in sort of in real time. Okay, thank you, Joanne. I think. Um, so for uh, Joanne or Sarah, why doesn't the exact same legal team that succeeded in getting a court order? for the EPA to issue the current proposed rule, which covers new sources, uh, immediately take the EPA back to court and get another court order for um, EPA to address uh, existing sources. Uh, this is Joanne. I'll take that one. Um, so it's ac the um, EPA entered a settlement agreement um, uh, quite a while back um, with, I think it was with Wild Earth Guardians, um, so somebody should correct me if I'm wrong about that, um, to uh, revisit, this is, was already an existing source category, but to essentially revisit and broaden this source category. Um, that was the rulemaking that EPA undertook in 2011 and 12. Um, and we, following the finalization of that rule, we and other um, organizations did file suit against EPA um, cha and challenging the final rule for failing to regulate methane emissions 
and we also um, sent them a notice letter, a separate notice letter threatening an additional lawsuit um, under different theories. And we uh, entered into negotiations with EPA, and then ultimately um, EPA ended up proposing the rule that's out there now. Our, our lawsuit has been held in abeyance. Um, unfortunately, we don't have legal leverage to get EPA to, to do an existing source rule until there's a final methane rule for new sources. The, the rule in 2012 didn't cover methane and um, and and that would that would the final methane rule is what would trigger regulating methane from existing sources. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Um, we're just going to take a couple more questions, um, and folks should know that if we don't get your question uh, uh, answered here live, uh, feel free to email it to us. Um, and we will uh, respond to you via email. Um, so the next question is, uh, strategically, where can we achieve the greatest impacts uh, from using uh, local FLIR footage, that infrared footage that shows this pollution? I found the results from the Greeley School application very alarming and high in uh, PR potential. Um, so I'm going to answer that one, although uh, if anybody else on the panel uh, wants to chime in, please go ahead. Um, so as uh, we mentioned at the outset, the um, sharing a video with decision makers and with uh, media and if you have access to them, like for example with Greeley, the local PTA or other affected populations, uh, it draws a reaction. So when we were in Greeley uh, and took that footage, we, we were there with the local group. Um, and uh, once the, uh, the, CO, the Colorado regulators were uh, shown this video, um, they were forced to respond and come out, um, where before they'd been giving the local group the back of their hand for a long time. Um, so it forces a reaction. Um, it, however, in that case, um, because the, uh, I believe the methane, the Colorado methane rule had not yet been enacted, um, they didn't actually do anything um, about it, except it was there were uh, a chain of stories in the Greeley paper, and um, the regulators came out and looked at it, and the operator knew that um, their operations were going to be more closely uh, covered, and they needed to shape up going forward. Um, part but the footage in Greeley also had a uh, a broader uh, impact because um, the Colorado methane rule um, uh, came about in part because uh, of not necessarily because of us specifically, but because uh, the state of Colorado uh, knows that. Uh, there's more chance for violators to be um, outed, so to speak. So every incremental use of this through local media to local decision makers to state decision makers uh, basically ups the ante, ups the pressure, and uh, requires operators to um, be more um, circumspect, at least. Uh, that maybe Sharon would have something to say about this. That ha it, that depends upon the political climate in the state. In Texas, where regulators are basically wholly owned subsidiary of the oil and gas industry, that is not so much the case. Um, but there, I will. 
I'll, I think I'll stop there. Do others want to uh, answer that question? What's the uh, greatest impact of use of infrared footage? Okay. Um, I am, I think that we are going to uh, stop here. Um, we have been recording this session and everybody who registered, whether you, they attended or not, will receive a, uh, a link to the recording. Um, and I will remind folks again that if you have questions that were not answered uh, live, you can email them to us and uh, we will respond via email. Uh, so with that, I will uh, thank our panel and thank everyone for attending, and uh, that is the end of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks for hosting.